when we want to build Web3, our goal is that users in control of their data, they're in control of their money and assets. This is Ilya Polosuhin. He's the co-founder of NIR, a layer one blockchain protocol that aims to build the foundation of a new internet by addressing Ethereum's limitations. We need easy programmability. We need kind of composability that is, you know, natural to the applications. And so like, I don't see the current Ethereum evolutions uh, targeting any of those goals. NIR protocol was among last year's fastest growing crypto projects. The value of its native token, NIR, increased by over a thousand percent in 2021. But what are the fundamentals behind NIR's impressive growth? And how does it plan to stand out in the increasingly fierce Layer 1 competition? Find out in our latest Cointelegraph interview. You, uh, in a blog post, said that back in 2018, you uh, were just starting uh, working on the NIR protocol. And uh, at that time, a blockchain was expensive, difficult to use, and not very scalable. It lacked the foundation for mass adoption. So what progress have been made? What have changed since then? Yeah, I think, I mean, I would say as a space, we've done a lot of work to kind of advance uh, that status, right? I mean, near along with a few other blockchains have definitely kind of pushed the limit on what you can do with scalability, what you can do with uh, kind of like capacity of the network such that a lot more people can participate and, and work with it, right? And obviously at NIR, we've been focused a lot on how to reduce barriers to entry. How do we make um, users e easier to onboard? From our side, we see the barrier to entry as well on developer side, right? Like learning new language, learning new paradigm is complex. It, it takes time. And so kind of reducing that barrier to entry through common programming languages like JavaScript and Rust, uh, and you know, there are other folks in the in the industry have been doing that as well, has been also tremendous because it allows to kind of inject more developers, and 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 we see that through the growth kind of of the developer space in general. But still, don't you think that it's still a bit far from being considered mainstream and 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 talking about mass adoption? Because I personally know uh, no one who is been regularly using the apps in their everyday uh, in the in their everyday routine. So from that perspective, uh, what is the problem still there? Yeah, so I would say we have a foundation, but yeah, we still need to build the actual building. One problem is if even when you want to build a kind of more consumer focused app, you you're facing this kind of high risk around regulatory uh, right now with blockchain. And that obviously like trumps a lot of the innovation and, and ability for people to execute. To progress forward, we need like more clear regulations, more clear paths for founders and, and users as well to actually come in into these platforms. And my expectation is that throughout this year, we'll see a lot of this changing and a lot of apps actually hitting like million you know, users um, who, who are actually like a dApp underneath or, or using part of the, like part of the app is actually using blockchain, but not the full app, right? Like we'll see this kind of more mixed versions of things. There's, mi there's millions of users. Back in December, you said in a tweet that uh, the current DeFi infrastructure is not mature enough to handle the next 10x, uh, 100x growth, both in assets and uh, users. So what should be done to address this scal scalability problem? DeFi applications, they are all designed at kind of, I would say, a lower gear use cases, right? Like AMM, if, if you're constantly using AMM, right, it, like you, you're just creating lots of, lots of arbitrage, right? That's why the, you know, stock markets are not using kind of automatic market makers. They are a stock market, there's a market, there's order books, there's, you know, lots of trading going on. And so we need to kind of go into like level level above that and you know build uh, like both financial infrastructure right that that's can rival we need the experience to also rival custodians are kind of financially viable only for a subset of of players in the market right so like what is the versions of this for for kind of market here what is the robin hood right uh version of this as well 
And at the same time, there's like treasury management, there is, you know, derivatives, there's all those instruments that exist in traditional markets that are right now only just kind of starting to get together in DeFi. And, and some of them like security around, you know, like all of the financial instruments in traditional market have an active security model, right? It's not kind of passive, oh, my seed phrase, you know, was stolen and all the money gone. Like that never happens. Like there's an active security thread, there is, you know, uh, machine learning models that analyze there is, you know, multiple double checks on, on outlier behavior. Like there's all those instruments that we're not using right now in crypto to actually create both kind of security as well as compliance, as well as um, just like better user experience. And so that's what I see kind of when I say infrastructure is like a whole, I would say layer of, of financial instruments that are missing. It's a whole layer of kind of security and user experience uh, pieces that are missing and then access to kind of more broad access to things like uh, custody and uh, or like or or mixed custody options right where um, you you know you know that your money will not be stolen because there is a custodian who is holding them but at the same time the custodian cannot steal your money either right like that kind of models we need to build uh, in the ecosystem and then and then we can kind of see growth in assets and growth in users beyond this Right. So you, you just need to create these security systems in a decentralized uh, way exactly, so, that, yeah. so, that, so that they emulate uh, those ones that are already in place in traditional finance. Yeah, yeah. But like, this is one of the pieces. So like, this is like, kind of a layer, layered cake of, of, of pieces that we need to grow in a way to get to the, to the same level. And then we can kind of continue scaling the, the usage of these platforms. Yeah, so basically security and again, and another component is compliance, as far as I understand, uh, you mentioned. I, I remember yeah, compliance is a big part and, and uh, kind of more, I would say, in traditional instruments like derivatives, you know, um, like ability to do kind of diversification, treasure management, you know, hedging, all this stuff, right? Like, how, how do you, you know, right now you need to manually click, like if you want to hedge your like position in some farm, you need to manually click to claim, to and stake to like maybe buy some other token, all the stuff, right? That's not usually how uh, you do things in more traditional instruments. Like the, the power is you can do all those things yourself, which maybe in traditional markets, you wouldn't even be able to because you need hundred million under management to even have access to those instruments, right? But the thing is like, we don't have those instruments if you do have hundred million, right? So that's, that's kind of the, the mix right now. So you said that the web three is not about uh, a single killer app but it's more about a composition of apps. So can you expand on this thought and uh, explain what you meant by that? For sure, yeah. So this is kind of, I mean, people always like go and look for a killer app, right, for everything. And so uh, from my perspective, because of the inversion of model, right, like when we, when we want to build Web3, our goal is that users in control of their data, they're in control of their money and assets, they you know, are able to govern these platforms which means there is no need for to build like a, you know, everything fulfilling for, like a uh, platform, right? Like you don't need to build a Facebook that will have all the apps inside it, everything inside it to have access to the data, right? It's an inverse model, right? S similar to Google. Google is like packing more and more things into itself. And so it's an inverse model where the users are users of the platform, but they can go into any app, right? Very easily. And so, uh, it's the same as like there's no killer website you know google just shows you all like websites you need kind of sim similar model google in inversed the you know before people would go to a specific website and would use it and would remember it but then google came and now you don't need to remember a specific website you just find the app you, or website you need right now and google will always find you this information uh, but the more interesting thing what web3 provides is this ability to compose things right let's say we we that instagram example i, I mentioned the Instagram itself is a powerful platform. It has a lot of users, but it doesn't allow people to build on top of it. It doesn't allow to build, you know, for example, I've, I've heard multiple people trying to build some kind of brand, brand to influencer marketplace, right? Ability for brands and influencers to connect, to create some kind of campaigns around that, you know, cloud models, all, all those things that you, you would imagine around something like Instagram, where you have influencers, where you have content, where you have kind of this propagation. But if we look at Web3, I mentioned you mint is, is is the same experience, but it's an open platform. Now this NFTs they mint are show up in all the markets. The 
minters themselves, the influencers themselves, are now accessible in all the other marketplaces. You can build easily a marketplace where, for example, somebody can reach out to this influencer. But even more so, this influencer themselves can turn their account into a DAO. This is actually one of the pretty unique features of NIR because accounts and contracts are the same. You can actually turn your account into like a more complex model over time. And so you can turn your account into a DAO, issue a token, and let brands, for example, buy this token to, uh, for example, uh, influence or, 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 or promote some of the products they're doing, right? So you can create like more, com like you can turn your personal brand into a business. You can turn business into a personal brand. You can like do all the things and it's all malleable and kind of changing, which is what, you know, the power is. And we see this in DeFi specifically because, yes, I mean, obviously exchange is probably a killer quote unquote killer app of, of, of finance, but like, it's not just exchange, right? There's so many other components that are working all together. The money is flowing there kind of, there's a lot of experimentation and things that are happening. And this is because the money are actually not in, inside this application, they're not inside some brokerage, they're not inside some bank. They're, they're on the user's account and they are able to kind of interact with any app using these assets kind of going through. And so that's kind of, for me, that's what Web3 is, is, is this idea of kind of infinite composability and by, that owned by the user because the data is on their side. Yeah, that's very fascinating. So the bottom line is having this uh, core, which is the user, that is uh, the owner of all his own data. And then the user can freely interact with the, this multitude of different apps and experiences without having to rely on one specific of them. Uh, it's more of a, of, a, of a kind of horizontal sort of, sort of system. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and you don't need to wait like, oh, will Instagram add this feature or not? Like some developer will build this feature as a separate app and you can use it, right? Things like that. You can easily flow between things uh, kind of versus you're locked in this platform and waiting until the developers of that platform do something. And so that's why it's going to be like a lot more kind of Fra fractured in some way, but then at the same time, it's all linked together. We haven't heard much about killer apps anymore for the last, uh, I mean, personally, I haven't heard about <laughs> that, that kind of concept for a while. And probably it's because everyone is realizing that that's not the point and, uh, I've been hearing much more about, yeah, like the importance of composability and, uh, the, the, yeah, the possibility to build a universe, a new, a completely new internet that cannot rely on, uh, on, a, on a killer app because a killer app is by itself some sort of centralized uh, Centralization, entity. yeah, point of centralization, yeah, exactly. Near Protocol has been uh, uh, considered the third fastest growing community for developers currently in the crypto space. Uh, so what do you think is the main factor that is attracting so many developers to come to your platform? Yeah, so I mentioned like kind of our focus on Developer experience and user experience is probably one of the key uh, attractors. And you know, common web languages like JavaScript that we support, we also support Rust, which is pro the most loved language uh, in developer community. And then we also like more languages are coming. There's more like specific languages, but like all of this com can compile into the same platform and interact with itself. And then on the other side, the user experience that they can build, right? The, this onboarding experiences which hide blockchain is you know provides a tremendous kind of asset for developers especially the web developers who are coming who are like okay i want to learn web 3 but you know i've been building web applications i know exactly how users should go through the flow and you know web 3 experience is all broken so we actually you know been focusing on making that experience really straightforward and then we've been doing a lot just kind of like scale scale up through DAOs and guilds and now regional hubs is this idea of like it cannot be, you know, a foundation or some developer companies. It's all about community, right? And so we have a really powerful community that's kind of like around the world is actually uh, educating, you know, bringing people, having meetups, um, participating in events and, and actually like teaching people about near and teaching people like how easy it is to build uh, for developer side, as well as just like being able to kind of attract the new people into this ecosystem. And then the final component I want to mention is we're non uh, 800 million dollars in funding and so obviously that as well uh, kind of attracts developers because there's a lot to build and so that that part is like you know funding development of core components that then other people can build on top of their own companies and projects have been very powerful as well so 
I would say, you know, ease of building, ease of use for their users, education community, and funding. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now I would like uh, maybe you to compare us, um, compare the near near protocol with one of the other uh, fastest growing protocols, layer one protocols that we saw in 2021, which is Solana. What is the main uh, point of differentiation or maybe adva competitive advantage that you would see in a protocol like the near protocol if compared to Solana, for example? For sure, yeah. So, so the kind of three pieces of uh, differentiation from that that were like our core value proposition in the first place. First of all, it's the scalability. The way we approach scalability is by sharding the processing, right? And this is the idea that you know Google, Facebook, all those companies, web companies, they don't process everything on one machine. They you know shard processing. They have users you know, accessing different computers at all times. And so that's a natural way to how we scale beyond what one computer can do. And pretty much all the non-sharded blockchain, including Solana, are approaching it as, let's just put a bigger machine or optimize how we process things, uh, but it's still limited by capacity of what single machine can do. And, and obviously like Solana goes up at it with like, hey, you know, let's build a better, hardware that is able to process more transactions and let optimize how we use this hardware, which gives them a pretty good kind of, I would say, space to fill. But our approach is we, we, we actually can continue scaling number of computers that processing things in parallel, right? So increase number of shards over time to continue scaling and, and you know, reach and be able to handle billion or more users. And the second thing is, is this, the simplicity of usage and, and development. It allows you to have a single, for, uh, single um, like a, a private key that's used for only for one time. It allows you to kind of create this like link experiences where you can sign a transaction, like a user can sign a transaction I mean, their front end uh, without needing to go to a wallet every time, right? So for gaming, for example, it's, it's instrumental to not needing to go every action that you do in a game to go and sign in a wallet, right? And so we, we, you can actually grant the access to the app for a specific set of actions once, and then, and then the app can sign transactions on their behalf for this set of actions, right? So this is all kind of unique enablers that your know, near ecosystem does. And then on the other side, like the common languages, so Solana does support Rust, but their programming model is more uh, similar to kind of how you program hardware, right? You need to understand blocks of memory. You need to kind of preload a lot of, like you need to lay out and preload existing uh, things. Near is more like building a web service. You have a key value store and you're writing your logic and that access is key value store. So it's very similar in conceptually to people who are building web services, who are building kind of existing microservices uh, architectures. And so, which there's a lot more people like that than people building uh, hardware. And so that, that I would say like kind of three main uh, kind of uh, differentiators. Joy Krug, co-chief investment officer at Pantera Capital, believes that Ethereum's competitors, such as NIR, are unlikely to threaten its dominance in the crypto market. So on the contrary, he believes that assuming Ethereum will complete its transition to a proof of stake system, uh, eventually all these competitors that are springing up will eventually rely on Ethereum as a base. So uh, what do you think about this vision? Yeah, so from our perspective, Ethereum is not a competitor. Kind of Ethereum, in many ways, we, you know, we've been learning from them. We've been building on top of some, some of the ideas that, that that community came up. And in general, kind of Ethereum is more of a community for me than like a specific piece of technology. But at the same time, kind of our vision is like very clear, right? We we want to achieve you know this Web three with billions of users, and like to do that, we need kind of the things that are outlined. We need simplicity of usage. We need easy programmability. We need kind of composability that is, you know, natural to the applications. And so like, I don't see the current Ethereum evolutions uh, targeting any of those goals, right? They, they are solving their kind of the issues they have, like the community wants to address and that's great. But at the same time, kind of, um, we see kind of the coexistence here and, and us continue to evolving into the vision that I outlined, right? The ability to bring this billions of users to give them applications that are really cross-linked and, and, and powered. And at the same time, we, you know, we are 
um, kind of have a bridge that connects to Ethereum. The, like it's a generic, you know, sec fully secure bridge. This Rainbow Bridge is the only, as far as I know, the only light client bridge that connects to Ethereum right now, um, which is like as secure as it possibly can be without doing full verification of both chains. And so kind of that, that allows not just to send tokens around, but it actually allows to read the state of each chain from the other chain. So you can actually pass any generic messages between them and execute contracts and do things like that. So like over time, there will be a lot more kind of cross-chain applications as well, if, if that's what users kind of expect. Okay, the, the, you said something interesting earlier. You said that uh, that the Ethereum community is not uh, focused that much on creating this vision of uh, interoperability and composability that is at the core of the NEAR protocol's mission. Am I understanding it correctly? So I, I would say like the current, currently as, as, as I understand it, the Ethereum community, right? The, the parts I see, people are focused on, you know, financial, people are focused on kind of assets, on, on creating kind of value and, and Ethereum being a settlement layer. Right. And that that's a pretty kind of heavy focus on that. And, you know, at least the previous year of switching from building a sharded Ethereum to building a data shards and, and roll up, right. Like roll ups naturally will kind of create less composability and, and create more kind of subspaces in which uh, things are happening. But they're obviously useful for, for specific like financial use cases and, 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 and specific other use cases as well. So but but obviously they create like some separation versus you know nearest vision by doing sharding by actually scaling up the uh, kind of composable structure we we allow to have a lot more applications running kind of closely with each other with the same account model with the same financial models as well so i would say like the, the kind of the visions at least as, again this is the vision that been communicated through the rollups through the kind of the roll-up centric vision uh have have been diverging Okay, and now uh, final question. I would uh, I would like to ask you regarding the latest funding round that you closed not long ago. You uh, closed a hundred and fifty million dollars funding round not long ago. So how are you going to deploy those funds in the course of two thousand twenty two? Yeah, so, so funding in general is all kind of being allocated to accelerate adoption of Web three. That that's that's our mission and that's what we're doing. And so this is by you know funding and. Kind of and developing the, the community, the global community, raising awareness of near, and then funding this uh, projects and kind of uh, an ecosystem in general, right? We have uh, you know kind of grants grants uh, program that been uh, kind of funding projects in the ecosystem and kind of accelerating develop their development, and then you know through the community we also kind of powering a lot of it. Awesome. Thanks a lot, uh, Ilya, for coming on our show. Thank you. Thank you for inviting.